Okay, welcome everybody to chapter 21, dealing with the respiratory system. The basic anatomy of the respiratory system is shown here. The organs are found at the head, neck, and thoracic cavity. It includes the blood vessels of the pulmonary circuit, the rib cage, and the respiratory muscles, and both lungs, as well as the respiratory tract. It's made up of hollow passages that collectively exchange gas. Each component of the tract has a unique gross and histological structure. It includes the nose and nasal cavity encased in the cranial and facial bones, the pharynx found in the throat, the larynx or voice box in the anterior neck, the trachea or windpipe in the mediastinum, the bronchial tree, which is a collection of branching tubes that get air down into the lung tissue where gas exchange can take place. It's classed anatomically into upper and lower tracts. The upper tract are the passageways from the nasal cavity to the larynx, while the lower are the passageways from the trachea to the respiratory tract's terminal structures, known as the alveoli. The alveoli are tiny air sacs arranged in grape-like clusters where gases are exchanged. The lungs are a pair of spongy organs in the thoracic cavity, closed within the boundaries of the rib cage and diaphragm. Each is a collection of millions of alveoli and their blood vessels embedded in elastic connective tissue with local branches of the respiratory tract. It's classed functionally into conducting and respiratory zones. The tubes of the conducting zone are conduits through which air travels on its way into or out of the body. If it's traveling into the body, it's inhaled or inspired. If it's traveling out, it's exhaled or expired. The air is filtered, warmed, and moistened as it travels through the zone. It includes structures from the nose and the nasal cavity to the bronchioles. The respiratory zone is where the gas exchange occurs and includes only structures that contain alveoli. Now it's very important to understand that the conducting zone has to repair the inhaled air for entry into the lungs so that it doesn't damage the tissue. This is why the filtering warming and humidification of the conducting system are so vital. Respiration is the primary function of this system. This is the process that provides the body cells with oxygen and removes waste products such as carbon dioxide. It includes four separate processes. Pulmonary ventilation, often shortened to ventilation, which is the movement of air in and out of the lungs. Pulmonary gas exchange, which is the movement of gas between the lungs and blood. Gas transport, which is the movement of gases through the blood. Tissue gas exchange, which is the movement of gases between blood and tissue. Other functions, it serves to maintain homeostasis. It serves as a mechanism for speech and sound production. Neurons located in this system provide our sense of smell. It's possible to expel contents from the abdominal pelvic cavity and to assist with defecation, urination, and childbirth by increasing pressure in the thoracic cavity, by holding your breath basically and pushing with your abdominal muscles. Pressure changes in thoracic cavity are assisted with the flow of venous blood and lymph in both thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavities. We talked about that with the skeletal muscle pump and the thoracic pump in the venous return to the heart and also with the flow of lymph through the lymphatic system. It's critical for maintaining acid-base balance in the extracellular fluid and it makes an enzyme involved in the production of angiotensin II known as ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, which is critical to the maintenance of blood pressure and fluid homeostasis. Now, at its core, what we have to understand is that the reason that we have to get oxygen to the cells and the tissues is so they can make sufficient ATP to survive. We know that in the absence of oxygen, you can only make 2 ATP per glucose molecule that the cell takes in, net, whereas in the presence of oxygen, you can make between 36 and 38. 2 ATP per glucose molecule is not enough to run the human body, and so you can see the utility of getting oxygen to the cells and tissues, even if they're at quite some distance from the respiratory system itself. We have to remove carbon dioxide because if it were to build up to high levels in the interstitial fluid in the blood, it would cause the pH to dangerously drop and that would create a toxic environment that would kill cells and tissues. Hence the role of ventilation. If we look at the anatomy of the system, 
starting at the top. The nose and nasal cavity are the entrance into the respiratory system and it serves the following functions. Inhaled air is warmed and humidified. Debris is filtered from inhaled air and antibacterial substances are secreted. Olfactory receptors are housed here. It enhances the resonance of the voice. The external anatomy of the nose is covered with skin and supported by muscle, bone, and cartilage. It's superiorly positioned. Um, pair of nasal bones, lateral and alar cartilages inferiorly produce the following surface features. The root and bridge of the nose, which are found between the eyebrows and eyes, respectively. The dorsum nasi, which is the anterior margin of the nose, and the apex, which is the tip. The alli, which are lateral to the apex, surround the nostrils or anterior nares. These are the paired openings into the nasal cavity. So, if we were looking for the bony parts of the nose, we're going to find out in a minute, up here and here are the bony portions. All of this material is cartilage, okay, as you can see in the cutaway, okay. The stuff that's in blue and in sort of bright yellow, that's all connective tissue independent of bone, okay, and the stuff in orange and in uh, taupe is bone itself. Inhaled air enters the nasal cavity, which is a hollow space formed by bone and hyaline cartilage, it extends anteriorly from the nostrils to the two posterior nares, which are the openings that the nasal cavity uses to get into the nasopharynx, the part of the throat that lies behind the nose. The nasal cavity is split into left and right portions by the nasal septum, which is made of bone and hyaline cartilage. The vestibule is the most anterior region of the nasal cavity just inside the nostril. Bristle-like hairs in this region prevent large objects from entering the nasal cavity. Three pairs of bony projections, the superior, inferior, and middle conchi, are processes of the ethmoid bone. The inferior concha is its own bone and fills most of the space in the nasal cavity. Now, what's the purpose of the conchi? To increase the surface area of the nasal mucosa and to allow the air to swirl and come into contact with the mucous membrane so it's more effectively filtered, humidified, and warmed up. The nasal conchi curl about three narrow passages. The superior, middle, and inferior nasal meatuses. This generates turbulence that rids dust and debris from inspired air. The paranasal sinuses are hollow cavities found within the frontal, ethmoid, sphenoid, and maxillary bones. They're connected to the nasal cavity by tiny passageways. They help to warm and humidify the air. They enhance voice resonance and they reduce the weight the cell types of the nasal cavity in the vestibule consist of stratified squamous epithelia that resist mechanical stress. Behind the vestibule, the epithelium changes to two types of mucous membrane, olfactory mucosa and respiratory mucosa. The olfactory mucosa is located on the roof of the nasal cavity and houses receptors for smell, while the cribriform plate of the ethmoid allows those bipolar neurons access to the nasal cavity. Remember that this is unique. This is one of the few special senses that bypasses the thalamus, and it's also the only region of the brain that periodically regenerates. The rest of the nasal cavity is lined with mucosa composed of pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelia and goblet cells. This is a combination of ciliated epithelia and mucus, which is trapped for air filtration. Foreign particles trapped in the mucus are propelled by ciliated cells towards the posterior nasal cavity in the pharynx, and this is known as the mucociliary escalator. The pharynx is the next anatomical segment of the respiratory tract that inspired air enters after exiting the nasal cavity. And it's split into three anatomical divisions. The nasopharynx behind the nose, lined with pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelia for warming, humidifying, and filtering inspired air. It runs from the posterior nares to the uvula, the uvula and soft palate move posteriorly doing swallowing and prevent food from entering the nasopharynx and nasal cavity. The oropharynx is the next segment, lies behind the mouth. It extends from the uvula to the tip of the larynx. It's lined with non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelia. It's more protective against mechanical stress as this cavity is a passageway for both air and food. 
The laryngopharynx is the last segment, and it extends from the hyoid bone to the esophagus, which is the tube that connects the oral cavity to the stomach. Anteriorly, it opens into the larynx or voice box, posteriorly into the esophagus. It's also a common passageway for air and food, and it's lined with non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelia. So again, we see in the, in the choice of tissues that line each of these parts of the upper respiratory, that you're going to pick something that's smooth on its surface, but also resists mechanical stress, hence the stratified nature of the epithelial tissue. It also aids in creating a barrier between what's inside the throat and what lies outside the throat. The larynx is the next anatomical region of the respiratory tract that inspired air enters. It keeps food and liquid out of the remaining respiratory tract and houses the vocal cords. It's a short tube anterior to the esophagus. The vocal cords create superior and inferior boundaries where two different types of epithelia are located. Stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelia protects the larynx from mechanical stress superior to the vocal cords where both food and air pass. Pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelia is found underneath the vocal cords. The cilia serve to propel mucus and debris up and out of the larynx as one clears the throat. Nine separate sections of cartilage, three unpaired and six pairs, provide flexible frameworks for the larynx. They also are supported by muscles that connect to the surrounding structures by muscles within the larynx itself. The thyroid, chrysoid, and most of the artenoid cartilage make up the, are made up of hyaline cartilage, while remaining sections are composed of elastic fibrocartilage. Elastic structures found within the cartilaginous framework are involved in sound production. The thyroid cartilage is the largest of the three to unpaired sections and forms a shield for the anterior and superior walls of the larynx. It's connected superiorly to the hyoid bone and inferiorly to the chrysoid cartilage by a fibrous membrane. The Adam's apple is an anterior protrusion of the thyroid cartilage, generally more prominent in males. The epiglottis is the next of the three unpaired sections. It lies behind the thyroid cartilage. Its base is attached to the posterior side of the thyroid cartilage. Its superior free edge is not attached to the surroundings. It looks like a little spoon with a handle on it. You can see it here looking from the back. The free superior edge usually stands upright and creates an opening called the glottis through which air can travel on its way to the lungs. Glottis would be right about down here. Okay. During swallowing the larynx is elevated by surrounding muscles and the glottis is closed by the epiglottis to prevent food and liquids from entering the larynx. The cough reflex expels food and liquid that manages to get through the glottis into the larynx and prevents damage to the remaining respiratory tract. The chrysoid cartilage is the third and last of the unpaired cartilages. It's found inferior to the thyroid cartilage to which it's connected by a thin membrane called the chrysothyroid ligament. A tube can be inserted through the ligament to provide an emergency airway in individuals that need a tracheostomy. The remaining six laryngeal cartilages are found in three pairs. Together they make up part of the posterior and lateral walls of the larynx. The artenoid cartilages are triangular and involved in sound production as they are attached to vocal cords and intrinsic muscles in the larynx. The corniculate cartilages are tiny pieces of cartilage capping each artenoid cartilage and are found um, to function in sound production and the cuneiform cartilages are found in the lateral walls of the larynx and they help support the epiglottis. The inner surface of the larynx is made up of folds of mucosa that project into the laryngeal lumen. The vestibular folds, or false vocal cords, run from the artenoid cartilages to the thyroid. They close off the glottis during swallowing and play no role in sound production, while the true vocal cords inferior to the vestibular folds, are also attached to both the artenoid and the thyroid cartilage. Vocal ligaments are elastic bands at the core of the vocal cords that give structure um, to this anatomical feature and produce a whitish appearance. They vibrate to produce sound when air passes over them. 
The musculature of the larynx controls the length and tension of the vocal cords by causing the artenoid and cornicular cartilages to pivot. A sound's pitch is largely determined by the tension of the vocal cords and the speed of vibration. When these cartilages rotate inward, the vocal cords adduct, the glottis narrows, and a high-pitched sound can be made because the vocal ligaments are tense and vibrate more rapidly. A low-pitched sound is produced when the vocal ligaments are abducted, making them looser so they vibrate more slowly. The loudness of a sound is determined by the force of the airstream. Greater force of expiration produces a louder sound. Air movement over the vocal cords only produces a buzzing sound. Actual speech requires the coordinated efforts of structures superior to the glottis, including the muscles of the pharynx, the soft palate, and the tongue and lips. And these are structures that are often dealt with in a profession known as speech pathology. The trachea is the next structure for the inspired air to enter. It flows through this on its way to the lower respiratory tract, and it begins in the inferior neck and ends in the mediastinum. If we take a cross-section through the trachea, we can see that hyaline cartilage rings cover the anterior and lateral surface of the trachea in a C-shape, leaving the posterior surface uncovered, and this is so that food and water can pass through the esophagus, which lines behind it, without becoming jammed. <coughs> the rings are supportive enough to keep the trachea open, but flexible enough to allow the trachea to change diameter during pulmonary ventilation. The posterior surface is covered with elastic connective tissue and a smooth muscle known as the tracheallus muscle, and this allows the esophagus to expand when you swallow. The carina is the last tracheal cartilage ring and forms a hook that curves down and back to form partial rings that surround the first branches of the bronchial tree. The carina's mucosa contains sensory receptors that trigger a violent cough reflex if foreign material gets into contact with it. The mucosa of the trachea, just like the inferior larynx, is lined with pseudostratified ciliated squamous epithelia and goblet cells. The tracheobronchial tree, shown here, once inhaled air reaches the carina, it can enter either the left or right bronchus at a structure in the lung known as the hilum. Once inside the lung, each bronchus branches into the bronchial tree which is a series of progressively smaller tubes that end in alveoli. The primary bronchi, beginning, which begin the bronchial tree, divide into left and right branches at the carina. The right primary bronchus is wider, shorter, and straighter than the left, which is narrow, longer, and more horizontal. Differences are due to the position of the heart in relation to the left lung. Note also the notch here to make space for the heart as well, the cardiac notch. The right is like, the more likely sign for inhaling foreign objects because of these anatomical differences. The primary bronchi branch into secondary bronchi once inside each lung, three on the right and two on the left side, again due to the position of the heart. The secondary bronchi branch into about ten smaller tertiary bronchi per lung and continue to branch into smaller and smaller branches. As the airways divide and get smaller, the histology changes. The primary bronchi are nearly identical to the trach, but three changes are evident as the bronchi gets smaller. Cartilage changes from the C-shape to complete rings in progressively fewer irregular plates. The epithelium gradually changes from respiratory epithelia in the larger bronchi to columnar cells in the smaller. The amount of smooth muscle increases and hyaline cartilage decreases as bronchi get progressively smaller. The tiny airways must be able to change diameter to control airflow in the bronchioles and the alveoli. And we'll see why this is. There's a phenomenon called ventilation perfusion coupling that takes advantage of this smooth muscle action. The bronchioles are the smallest airways and their features differ from larger airways. Simple cuboidal epithelia with few cilia, if any, are enclosed within a thick ring of smooth muscle devoid of hyaline cartilage. The conducting zone of the respiratory tract ends when expired air reaches the terminal bronchioles. The terminal bronchioles branch into two or more smaller respiratory bronchioles surrounded by a thin layer of smooth muscle. The respiratory zone begins with the respiratory bronchioles 
with alveoli that bud from their walls. Each respiratory bronchial branches into two or more alveolar ducts. They also have alveoli attached to their walls. The alveolar ducts end in alveolar sacs, which are grape-like clusters of alveoli. The inspired air has thus arrived where gas exchange can take place. And so the conducting division's job, mainly, is to get the air down into the respiratory division, and the job of the respiratory division is to swap oxygen for carbon dioxide. Okay? bottom line. So you can see the pathway that we take from the external nares all the way to the alveoli. Again, I want you to know this. The alveoli are the final destination for inspired air within the respiratory tract. Each single round thin-walled alveolus has three cell types. Type 1 alveolar cells are squamous cells that account for about 90 percent of the cells in the alveolar wall. They're thin, Structural features in these cells allow for rapid diffusion of gases across cell membranes. The type 1 cells are one of three components of the respiratory membrane, which is a barrier through which inspired gas must diffuse. The formation of the simple squamous cells of the alveolus with the endothelial cells in the pulmonary capillary is part of what we call the respiratory membrane. This provides a huge amount of surface area and increases gas exchange efficiency and represents another example of the structure function core principle. So when we look here, right, we see squamous pneumocytes, the alveoli, the basal lamina, and then the endothelial cells of the capillary. And so this isn't very much distance through which oxygen and carbon dioxide can move down their concentration gradients. Type 2 alveolar cells are cuboidal cells that account for 10 percent of the cells in the alveolar wall. They're responsible for synthesis of surfactant, which is a chemical that reduces surface tension in the alveoli. Alveolar macrophages are mobile phagocytes derived from bone marrow. They clean up and digest debris that made its way into the alveoli. Okay. And um, these, going back to the surfactant, it breaks up surface tension, okay? It acts as a detergent, and that allows the lungs ease of expansion. If you're a premature infant and you're born with a lack of surfactant production by your type 2s, we have to give you surfactant as an inhalant in order for you to be able to breathe. This is a condition called IRDS, or Infant Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Okay, next topic is tuberculosis, so let's take a listen. Tuberculosis, or TB disease. TB is spread through the air from one person to another. When a person breathes in TB bacteria, it can settle in the lungs and begin to grow. It is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, which usually attacks the lungs. It can also attack any part of the body, including the kidneys, spine, and brain. It can be fatal if not treated properly. Some people have serious side effects from TB medications. Should you develop any, you must call your doctor or nurse right away. Okay, the right and left lungs are split by the heart and mediastinum. The lungs inferior flat base rests on the diaphragm while its superior apex is just below the clavicle. Anterior, posterior, and lateral lung surfaces are in contact with the rib cage. These are called the costal surfaces of the lung. The medial lung surface in contact with the mediastinum is known as the mediastinal surface. The hilum is the triangular depression found in the mediastinal surface of each lung where the primary bronchi, the blood and lymphatic vessels, and the nerves enter and exit. The cardiac notch is the groove in the mediastinal surface of the left lung where it comes into contact with the heart. Each lung is split into lobes, the right lung with three, the left with two, due to the space needed for the heart. The right lung is split into superior, middle, and inferior lobes, 
The horizontal fissure separates the superior from the middle lobes, and the oblique separates the middle from the inferior. The left lung is split into superior and inferior lobes, divided by the oblique fissure. Each secondary bronchus supplies one lobe of the lung, commonly called lobar bronchi, as a result. The lobes are further split by thin walls of connective tissue into bronchopulmonary segments, the tertiary bronchi, therefore are commonly called segmental bronchi. Each bronchopulmonary segment is further split into dime-sized hexagonal structures known as lobules. Each lung is found within a pleural cavity, which is a subdivision of the thoracic cavity. It's located between two layers of serous membrane. The parietal pleura is the outer layer of the serous membrane fused to the rib cage, diaphragm, and local structures. At the hilum, the parietal pleura turns over on itself to create an inner layer of membrane called the visceral pleura. The visceral layer is continuous with the surface of the lungs and dives into fissures between the lobes. The pleural membranes secrete a thin layer of serous fluid called pleural fluid that fills the space between the layers and lubricates the delicate surfaces of the lungs as they expand and contract during ventilation. And so again we see a repeating theme, right? All the internal organs are covered by a serous membrane that secretes a lubricating fluid so that as internal movement takes place we don't irritate and inflame and scar the structures. A condition known as pleurisy is the result of a lack of production of pleural fluid that generates painful ventilation. Many conditions, from heart failure to pneumonia, can cause inflammation of the visceral and parietal pleura. Pleuritic pain is one of the most common symptoms. This is chest pain upon inhalation that results from the inflamed pleura rubbing together as the lungs expand and contract. The rubbing can sometimes be heard with a stethoscope. This is termed the pleural friction rub, and it sounds like sandpaper. The treatment for the underlying condition has to be addressed and may persist for months even after the condition has resolved due to lasting inflammation. So what brings this on? Viral infection, bacterial infection, trauma, there's any number of conditions that can result in pleurisy. Okay, next topic we want to deal with is pulmonary ventilation. And so let's listen to the gas laws. Consider a gas-filled container that has a movable piston. It is exposed to an atmospheric pressure of one atmosphere. Click on one of the buttons to see animations of how temperature, pressure, or the number of gas particles affects the volume that the gas occupies. You can increase the pressure by adding a weight on top of the piston. Let's add a weight that will increase the pressure on the top of the piston to two atmospheres. As the pressure on the gas increases, the volume that the gas occupies decreases. The volume that the gas occupies will continue to decrease until the pressure of the gas equals the external pressure on the piston, which is two atmospheres. The volume occupied by the gas will be half its original volume. You should see that the volume is inversely proportional to the pressure. V is proportional to 1 over P. Adding a proportionality constant K, we can write volume equals K divided by pressure, or pressure times volume equals K. This relation is known as Boyle's Law, which states that the volume of a fixed amount of gas is inversely proportional to the gas pressure at constant temperature. As the pressure on the gas decreases, the volume that the gas occupies increases. The volume that the gas occupies will continue to increase until the pressure of the gas is equal to the atmospheric pressure on the piston, which is one atmosphere. Let's use a Bunsen burner to increase the temperature of the gas. As the temperature is raised, the average velocity of the gas particles increases, thereby the frequency and intensity of collisions of gas particles with the container walls increase. Pressure, which is defined as the force exerted per unit of surface area, will clearly increase as the frequency and intensity of collisions increase. Pressure for a fixed amount of gas at constant volume is directly proportional to the temperature. Note that as temperature is doubled at constant volume, the pressure exerted by the gas When the doubles. Bunsen burner is removed, the temperature of the gas decreases. The average velocity of the gas particles decreases, thereby the frequency and intensity of collisions of gas particles with the container walls decrease. 
pressure for a fixed amount of gas at constant volume is directly proportional to the temperature. Let's use a Bunsen burner to increase the temperature of the gas. As the temperature of the gas increases, the volume that the gas occupies increases. In other words, volume is directly proportional to the temperature of the gas. We can write volume equals K times temperature, where K is a proportionality constant. This relation is known as Charles' Law, which states that the volume of a fixed amount of gas is directly proportional to the gas temperature at constant pressure. Note that as the temperature is doubled at constant pressure, the volume that the gas occupies When the Bunsen doubles. burner is removed, the temperature of the gas decreases, and the volume that the gas occupies decreases. The volume that the gas occupies will continue to decrease until the temperature of the gas equals the external temperature. Gas particles are entering the container. As the number of particles, or equivalently the moles of gas increases, the volume that the gas occupies increases. In other words, volume is directly proportional to the number of moles of gas. We can write volume equals K times N, where N is the number of moles of gas and K is a proportionality constant. This relation is known as Avogadro's Law, which states that at constant pressure and temperature, the volume of a gas is directly proportional to the number of moles of the gas. In this animation, the moles of gas particles is doubled, and correspondingly the volume occupied by the gas is doubled. Now, one of the things that we can do to simplify the set of gas laws we just learned about is to learn the perfect gas law. This is an equation that covers all contingencies, and it simply states that PV equals nRT, where P is pressure, V is volume, N is the number of moles of gas, R is a constant, and T is the temperature in degrees Kelvin. Okay, so this will account for Boyle's law, Charles' law, um, Avogadro's law, all of that. If you learn this equation, um, you can use it to establish initial and final conditions, and this will inform you of the changes that take place when you change one of these variables. Dalton's law of partial pressure states that each gas in a mixture exerts its own pressure, known as the partial pressure of the gas. The total pressure of a gas mix is the sum of the partial pressures of its components. So if we look, for instance, at the composition of air, okay, which is 20% um, oxygen, about 70% nitrogen, and a vanishing small amount of carbon dioxide and other trace gases, you add up the pressures that are uh, from each of those individual gases, you get the total atmospheric pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level. The higher you go up on the mountains, the lower the atmospheric pressure becomes, the further you get below sea level, the higher it becomes. Okay? If we were to compute the pressure of nitrogen alone, okay, um, take the percentage of nitrogen in the air, here they're saying 78%, and multiply by 760, and you get 593 millimeters of mercury from the nitrogen, 160 from the oxygen, and from the remaining rare gases, about 7 millimeters of mercury. So the partial pressure of a gas in a mix determines where the gas diffuses. The rate of gas diffusion from high to low pressure is determined by the steepness of the pressure gradient between the two areas and is an example of the gradient core principle. And this is what dictates, for instance, the movement of carbon dioxide out of lung tissue and into exhaled air, while at the same time the movement of oxygen is from inhaled air into the blood. It has to do with partial pressures, as we'll see here in this review of pulmonary ventilation. At the end of expiration, barometric air pressure and alveolar air pressure are equal. Therefore, no movement of air into or out of the lungs takes place. Inspiration begins with contraction of inspiratory muscles to increase thoracic volume. This results in expansion of the lungs and an increase in alveolar volume.
The increased alveolar volume causes a decrease in alveolar pressure below barometric air pressure and air flows into the lungs. At the end of inspiration, the thorax and alveoli stop expanding. Air flow into the lungs causes alveolar pressure to become equal to barometric air pressure. Because the pressures become equal, no more movement of air occurs. During expiration, the volume of the thorax decreases as the diaphragm relaxes and the thorax and lungs recoil. This results in a decrease in alveolar volume and an increase in alveolar pressure. Since the alveolar pressure is now greater than barometric air pressure, air flows out of the lungs. Air continues to flow out of the lungs until alveolar pressure becomes equal to barometric pressure. Okay, what you're looking at here are the volume changes involved in ventilation. The main muscle of inspiration is the diaphragm, but it's also assisted by the external intercostals as well as the sternocleidomastoid and the pectoralis minor, just to name a few. And the idea here is that with a constant volume of gas um, in the lungs, if we increase the volume, then you're going to decrease the pressure. That'll create a vacuum and the air will rush in to fill the vacuum and thus ventilation inspiration takes place. Okay. On the flip side, okay, when we're talking about exhalation, it's largely a passive process. The diaphragm relaxes and goes back to its domed shape. This decreases the volume around the outside of the lungs, compresses the lungs, and forces the air out, okay, because the pressure rises above atmospheric. And this is why we call the method of breathing that we undergo negative pressure breathing. In negative pressure breathing, you create a negative pressure around the lungs, that's a vacuum, and vacuum is translated to the lung tissue itself, and that's what draws the air into the lungs. And so here you can see the, the changes in volume that take place during inspiration and expiration, right, and the muscles that are involved. Now, keep in mind that when we're talking about the muscles of breathing, these are all skeletal muscle, okay, so they're all innervated by um, nerves <coughs> that are under voluntary control, okay. The main nerve that innervates the diaphragm is known as the phrenic nerve, that's phrenic with a pH, okay, and from A and P1, we already know the muscles that innervate uh, things like the sternocleidomastoid and the pec minor, okay? Um, so we have conscious control over this. Now, when we sleep, we continue to breathe, thank goodness, and this is the result of brainstem activity rhythmically innervating the muscles of inspiration, okay? This happens at the level of the medulla and the pons, um, talking to nerves that innervate the, the diaphragm, okay? And a failure of this rhythmic innervation can result in a condition known as central sleep apnea, which is thought to be responsible for a condition known as SIDS, or Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. Three primary physical factors of the respiratory tract in the lungs that influence the overall effectiveness of pulmonary ventilation include airway resistance, which is defined as anything that impedes airflow through the respiratory tract, and alveolar surface tension. Alveoli are covered with a thin film of liquid made up of mainly water, creating a gas-water boundary through which the gases can diffuse, as well as pulmonary compliance, which refers to the ability of the lungs and the chest wall to stretch. Airway resistance is largely determined by airway diameter. Resistance decreases slightly during inspiration as the airways are pulled open as the lungs expand. Resistance increases slightly as the lungs recoil and the airways narrow during expiration. The diameter of the bronchioles is controlled by smooth muscle contraction and relaxation, known as bronchodilation and bronchoconstriction. Relaxation increases the diameter of the bronchioles and decreases the airways resistant and increases air flow. Contraction, known as bronchoconstriction, decreases the diameter of the bronchioles, increases airway resistance, and decreases air flow. Remember that 
flow is inversely proportional to resistance. The more resistance you have, the less flow you're going to experience. Alveolar surface tension is another physical factor affecting ventilation. The alveoli are covered with a thin film of liquid, mainly water. The gas-water boundary exists within each alveolus where water molecules hydrogen bond with each other. The gases are nonpolar molecules and therefore do not form hydrogen bonds. This creates surface tension at the gas-water boundary, which is at its greatest when the alveoli are at their smallest diameter during expiration. Okay. So um, let's take a, a break. This brings to the end of the first half of this podcast, and I will see you guys in part two.